ברוך אתה ה' אלוהינו מלך העולם, אשר נותן התורה. אמן. Father, I just want to thank you for your Shabbat. Thank you that we can just come and sit together as family. Father, I pray that you would anoint me, Father, that you would flow through me, that they would hear you and only you. Abba, we just thank you again that we can study your word. I pray that you would feed us, that you would guide us, that you would convict us when necessary. Help us grow in this time, Lord Father, and we just want to thank you. Thank you for your blessings and thank you for your love. In your shares, name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, just before we get into this, I know that most of you are really uh, getting involved in this idea that we call Elul. How many of you are really feeling that God is poking your heart condition? Yeah, right, okay. Um, I just want to share with you guys, I believe God shared with me maybe a week, maybe about 10 days ago, that he was really going to start to test people's motives. All right. Um, basically, what that means is he's going he's gonna to give you those choices and he's going to weigh up your choices. All right. Be careful. What you say, what you do. I know sometimes we get frustrated. Sometimes we get emotional. Sometimes we get nervous. Sometimes it's 50 things on one half a dozen of the other things. But he's showing you if there is a place where you tend to step more to the left and not follow the mitzvah or not spend time with him, that means there's something that is not functioning properly. Okay? If you get into the place and you start to grab hold of and you start to fight for and you start to push more, that will show you where you are spiritually. And if you've been around long enough, you know that it's very difficult at times on the right. But it is an opportunity for you to ask God to fix and change the things that is going wrong with your heart. He's not doing this to break you down. He's doing it so that you can see where you are. And you can rectify it. Because one of the most unkind things is allowing you to believe something that's a lie. Oh, no worry. You're a good person. You're saved. Everything is fine. Right? And you can lie to yourself for a really long time. Until you start to realize. Hang on a second, that person, those choices, those things, that was me. And I've been justifying a lot. I've been excusing myself to do things. I've been making excuses for a really long time. Right, right chain friend, you've got plenty of space. And when we get to that, when we get to that sort of, when we get to that point where we start to excuse our sin, where we start to justify why it's okay for us not to read the word, where we allow our emotions to take over, when it's just easier to walk away. Those are those moments when I need you to take a breath. You know, whenever I think of those moments when we really struggle, I think of Elijah. You know, Elijah, after call, taking on the prophets of Baal, lightning, hitting down, God answers. He's like, case closed, prophets, job is done. In the next chapter, he says, the right Jezebel says, I'm hunting boot and I'm hunting for you. And he's just like, what's the point? Just kill me now. Because if they won't learn or they won't listen after a miracle like that, when will they ever? I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm shouting and I'm, and I'm, and I'm crying and I'm, and I'm screaming to these guys and I want them to come back home and they just refuse. They, won't, they will even deny the miracles they see. You know what um, God told Elijah to do when he was having that moment? I'm going to say it in a way that seems kind of condescending, but I think the heart of it really is there. Have a little nap, eat some food, 
and we'll talk tomorrow. When someone gets really overwhelmed and they go through difficult times, sometimes you're exhausted and you throw a fantastic tantrum. Yeah, I'm laughing because that's like a reality, right? I'm tired, I'm hungry, I'm grumpy, leave me alone, I hate my life, work's training me, it's this, it's that, and it's all the rest of it. But that's exactly what it is. It's nothing but a thing, a moment in time. You burn yourself out, take some time. It's probably because you haven't spent enough time in this, which is why you feel weak. Yom Kippur is coming up and I'm going to probably look at a whole bunch of long faces after a long time of fasting. And they're all going to be crawling up the stairs from water loss and headaches and all types of fun things. And I just can't believe I'm doing this. It's such a horrible time and it's so difficult. And you guys understand what your body, how your body functions if you don't give it water and if you don't give it food for a day, yes? Badly, very badly. So why do we think it's okay if you go without a day of reading a word? Why do you think it's okay if you don't get watered by the Ruach HaKodesh? Why do you think it's okay? There's lots of chairs up here front, guys. So what we do is we ignore that part because we don't see the immediate physical effects. Not the way we think we do, but the reality is you're going to feel it. And God is looking at your heart condition and he's checking your motives and he says, do me a favor, take stock and see what comes out of your mouth and what you do with your hands. See what is reflecting in your mind. Elul is not about justifying your sin. Yeah, but he did this and she did that and he did whatever. Elul is about taking responsibility for your own mouth. For your own sin, not everybody else's. So if you feel distant, if you feel you're making the wrong decisions, if you feel you're struggling with your faith, pray. And be open, be real. This thing of going over there and expecting that God doesn't see right through your empty words. I'm struggling with my faith right now. And it know it, I know it's not you, it's me. So change that thing that's broken in me. Fix that thing that's not right to me. I'm struggling wherever. I'm making the wrong choices. I'm empty. I feel alone. Why is that? Take it from us. It's left. And the reason you probably left is because you've been hurt before by someone else and you we have a tendency to project that nonsense onto him you have a fight with your husband it's God's it's God's fault you have a fight with whoever it's God's fault your father let you down once upon a time ten years ago he doesn't answer the prayer the way you want it must be God's fault you know, God will be your punching bag. He is. He was for a very long time. Specific time we're in. Baptized. What I should know is what's coming out of these pages. You will find TV time. You want for recognition in the office. You will find people's recognition. You will fight for ex You will fight. For Welcome to the front. It's not enough. There's a change right there for you. And it's going to get tough, and things are difficult sometimes. But sometimes. But I need you to just take stock. You're not doing this for right now. You're investing. In, um, you know, I was just sharing that people downstairs, and we're going to get into this. Every time you make a choice, make that choice often enough, it becomes a habit. Right? We understand that. It defines who you are. When we backslide, it's the wrong choice. It happens. And it's in justification, one excuse, one whatever, and slowly it becomes easier.
If you've ever tried to go to gym and you've made that first excuse about why you want to go, then you know you're not going to see that gym for a couple of weeks. <laughs> or years. <laughs> I remember gym. Guy hurt me. All right. You guys got anything you want to share? Get off your chest. I believe that the father is saying, just as Moses had to take off his shoes at the burning bush, the father is saying, take off yourself shoes. Take off yourself shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Hmm. I shared with you guys a, a, a portion in the first session. Um, there was Jeremiah 7 last week. Uh, be on the, and the just of the picture, something like this. You come in here, you make offerings, but your heart's not here. There's sexual immorality, there's adultery, there's blasphemy, there's greed, there's idolatry. And you come in here into and you pretend like everything's fine. I said it once, I said it I'll say it again. I don't think this time of testing is over just yet, but it's a year of favor and he's busy. Testing and building so that we can grow. He's investing in you. What is hidden in the dark will come to light. If you think you're fooling anybody, you're only fooling yourself. God will bring it out. And if we establish this, if we come in here and God says this is his house, we are his people. Don't think for a second that this scripture doesn't apply. He knows your heart. He knows your motives. He knows what happens when you go home and he knows what following God for me. You're following God for you. It is for your benefit, for your growth, for your life. So choose life. Mark, you want to say something? Don't um, mistake uh, God's lack of judgment for he'll never punish you. That's mercy. The important point. You think you get away with it once? It's okay. You are going to deal with with the consequences one way or another and either way every time we make the wrong decision you stick a finger in God's eye when you sin you don't only really hurt yourself guys you hurt the people around you and you hurt God most of all you think you're hurting you think you're struggling sometimes when he's sitting over there Weeping over the people that refuse to change. I don't think we fully even grasp or even understand when we walk away. And we make it a trivial matter. I'm just going to. We have to get real with ourselves and we have to start making those changes. Okay, I'll give you some good news though. Sure. Um, just to keep, get us back on track to what we should be doing. Um, a week before last, I actually went into um, rest back. And it was pressure, pressure, pressure. We had to get this, we had to get that. And I got to the top, and the lady was like, that thing. Now, this, this is her army with that thing. She was battling. I said, What's wrong? She said, My hand. I said, Give it here. Just without thinking. I said, Give it here. In the middle of this whole thing, people waiting and whatever, I just held her hand and I prayed up. I said, No, we I went back on Thursday, and the one lady, she wasn't the same lady, and I probably wouldn't have recognized her anyway. And I was talking to the lady, saying, I was also saying, Same thing, pressure, 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 pushing, pushing, pushing. We had to get up, had to do that. She said, That lady there, her hand, she said, Hello, oh. Uh, it's fixed. I said, oh. I, said, oh. I, said, oh. I, said, I literally pray over people all the time, and I, I didn't hear you. So I said, you can do the same thing now. I mean. understand. You are healed. You can actually do that. You can pass it on to you. In the name of Yeshua and Mashiach, you can make these people to heal. So we had been pressure, 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 pressure. God was a long way away. Mm. And he just suddenly said, hey. Hmm. And it was it was almost like an instinct that said, "Do it," and it works. 
Estava fechado. Isso. Eu não tenho cheiras, eu 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 tenho I was struggling with a few things and I was hiding a lot of secrets. And I knew the secrets were weighing me down. And it was stopping me from living for Jesus and being able to talk about him everywhere because I felt this guilt. And Richard came home one evening and he told me about somebody who had a dream at a men's camp. And the same dream was um, they were sitting around a campfire, him and a few men, and there was a girl, his daughter, was shouting, screaming for help. Now they were sitting in a setting of a, like a truly national park, somewhere where it was wild. And in this setting, she started screaming, and they got up, jumped up, and they had to go and help her. And they jumped up, and they had to go and help her. And um, as the, the guy started running, to go into the direction of her shouting. Um, every man stopped and fell to the ground and his hands were tied up. And this happened every time a lion roared. So they were running and a lion would roar, his arms tied up and his feet tied down. At, at the end, it was only one man who made it through to go and save the girl. And he then asked, but what was this dream all about? What was God trying to tell him? And he then, God revealed to him that whenever the lion roars, whatever there is in secret, the enemy just needs to bring that up and ties you down. And then you, you can't, can't go and do the work. Michael, you can't even talk about it because you feel so guilty. You feel so tied up in your problems. Mm. And that spoke to me in such a deep way. And it made me realize about saying, let go of all of these things, bring it out into the light, because when it's in the light, the enemy cannot keep you down and tie you up. Mm. And after sharing what I had to share, I felt this weight just lifted. I didn't even care what the consequences were, and it was bad, but I was free. Mm. And this, I feel, is very applicable to Allah, all the things that we need to bring out to make us, to set us free. Yeah, I think a lot of the times we, and then, um, because we don't want to acknowledge the fact that it was us and take responsibility for it, right? And it's um, almost easier to, do, to, to read the scripture that God forgives you, but you never forgive yourself. You need to listen up carefully, guys. God's never wrong. If he says, what sin is the one that's right? You don't need to keep on reminding yourself of all the horrible things that you've done. That might have been who you were. But that's not who you are. Okay? Um, I normally use this illustration when we do like um, uh, Yom Kippur, but it was like picture your life coming into your spiritual walk. Pure, holy, perfect. Yes? Lavan. Nothing but whiteness. And slowly but surely as you grow, you get little black lines all over your pages. And those little black lines are sin. And you come in once a year at Yom Kippur, or you come to the cross and you say, Father, I did that. That was me. Not because he or she or made me do it. No, that, that was circumstance. That, that is, does not define your response. You chose to act a certain way. You take hold of that, and then he goes, I remember your sin no more. And you can take a big, deep breath and go, thank you, Abba. This is what the power of the cross does. You don't have to live in the past. Let him be your covering. Let him deal with your sin. And you can move forward. But you choose. You choose to keep on showing him this when he keeps on showing you this. Okay? So... Tough thing in Elul, sometimes as we take stock, we also need to acknowledge when we get to Yom Kippur, forgive yourself. Look on it. Mm -hmm.
take right us from another thought. Everyone that can do it is just up. Right. No one else can take right from the loving God. And therefore we also have to forgive ourselves and make sure that we repent when we have sex. Yeah, Prophet Teshavai has changed, yes? Coming back and stopping what you're doing. That's actual change. Don't tell me you or you do it for one week or two weeks or whatever, and then you go back to the same. You weren't sorry. Actual change. Make a commitment to yourself to change. To start becoming the person that he called you to be. Not the person you think you are, but the person he thinks you are. There's a big, big, big difference. All right. Happy day? All right, let's see what we can we learn from Peter. All right, so just before we ended last week, he dealt with, um, he was arrested by Agrippa. He was freed by an angel. They went to Jerusalem Council to discuss what do we teach the Gentiles. And we spoke about that. And that tied us back in with the binding and loosing of banyas. Whatever you allow, whatever you permit will be permitted. Whatever you don't allow won't out as in basic halachic decisions in little understanding so that they would be able to grow in their understanding bring them in with love and slowly build them up slowly teach them okay um we jump now to galatians <coughs> you guys trying to figure out where i am yeah right. this this is all over the place guys okay so galatians galatians 2 verse 11 we find that Peter gets into a bit of a, an issue, okay? Furthermore, when Kepha came to Antioch, he, I opposed him publicly. So this is Paul talking, Shaul, 2 verse 11. Because he was clearly in the wrong, for prior to the arrival of certain people from the community headed by Yaakov, he had been eating with the Gentile believers. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he was afraid of the faction who favored circumcising Gentile believers. Now, when you read Galatians or you read anything about the New Testament, circumcision means what? Conversion. You have the uncircumcised and you have the circumcised us. It is not just talking about the operation. The operation tells you about the heart condition of the people. I belong to God. He belongs. Um, I belong to him. He belongs to me. And I step out into obedience and I go get the snip snip. Okay. So he says now all of a sudden he was eating with them. And then when other people came, he didn't eat with them. Why? Okay, but uh, help me understand from a biblical point of view. Partly. So I can eat with someone who's not in covenant. Peer pressure. Peer pressure, they were seen as? They were seen as heathens, right? Remember that in Acts 10, Peter goes out to Cornelius and he says, I am not to call anything unclean which God has called clean. He was talking about people, right? So you know, they come in and other people go, how can you eat with those uncircumcised people? They don't know what kosher is. But he's not just talking about kosher, as in the word kosher means proper, by the way. Not just what is all the halachic understanding of the Pharisees, but actually what is biblical okay. All right? Uh, you you might, have, might have heard me say, you know, we don't eat kosher, we eat publicly clean. What's the difference? Right. So if you were to become a proselyte today, convert to Judaism, you as a Gentile would be under strict scrutiny to the point where they will come and investigate your kitchen. Now, you should be asking which one? Because according to halakha, rabbinic understanding, you have a dairy side and you have a meat side. You have dishes and pots, you have dishes and pots. The two will never come across. Okay? That is from an interpretation of the word that says you will not boil a kid in its mother's milk. I have a different interpretation, one I can back up through scripture. Number one, Abraham served 
Elohim himself, curd, smoke, and meat. Now, the rabbis will say, don't be ridiculous, he served him meat first, then he waited now, and then the fat cough came. It doesn't say that in the scripture. It says he gave them all, and then they ate. Number one. Number two, where else in any document do I find boiling a kid in its mother's milk? Okay, in the Ugaritic texts. What is a Ugaritic text? It's a text they found in a city called Ugar. Okay, if you guys want to go and do some research into this, it's quite interesting. Okay, we started to understand more of the Canaanite understanding when they used to boil a kid in its mother's milk as a fertility practice. So what God was saying was, don't act like the Canaanites. Not don't meet, don't mix meat and dairy. That's a completely different understanding. Okay. So it comes to that. So then he says, well, how can you trust them? Remember all the halakha and all the other things and all the rest of it. If you're eating with them, you're telling them it's okay. Never mind that Middle Eastern custom. And he says, look, they're believers. Are they not born again? Are they not sons and daughters of the Most High? Are they not part of us? Peter saw Cornelius getting baptized in the Ruach HaKodesh. Who was the one that should have stood up? It should have been Peter, but Paul had to correct him. Okay, so even great men like Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, sometimes have a little bit of a wobble. That should give us hope. You're not going to be perfect all the time. God willing, we should be, but sometimes we get in the way of our own perfection. Okay, that God is flowing through us. Okay, we know in 1 Corinthians 1, you can mark this down, we don't have to turn there. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 12, he visited Corinth. So when we deal with Corinthians, we know that Peter had an influence there. In 1 Peter 5 verse 3, which we will discuss, he visited Rome at a time. He actually nicknamed modern day, Ro well, Rome in that time was called Babylon. He uses a term. And it's like, how is good old Babylon? So like, if we go into America and I say, Yana, we drove past Sodom and Gomorrah, what town am I talking about? Uh, Vegas. Yeah, Vegas, Sin City, right? <laughs> right. So yeah, we went around Sodom and Gomorrah because we knew that was not a place for us. Okay, so it's that sort of thing. <laughs> no, no, there are there are places that still stand for God there. Okay, so that will kind of bring us through to the, the, the basic narratives of what's there. Now I'm going to take you into some traditions that we know about it. And these traditions have been written accounts, okay, from disciples, disciples, and other historians, so church fathers basically. Okay, two guys that we that you'll hear about if you study early church history is a guy called Ignatius and Irenaeus. Okay, they said that both said that Paul and Peter founded the community in Rome. All right, it's a tradition I can't tell you biblically that was the case. But when they went over there, remember Paul went in too. When he got off the boat, where did he go? Says a time and he argued with them using Torah that Yeshua is the Messiah. An exercise I'm going to get you to do one day is you are going to convince me using Torah, not the Tanakh, no prophets allowed, using Torah that Yeshua is the Messiah. Yeah. Honestly, it must be a quid pro quo in some sense because why did Yeshua said to the Pharisees? Your law says in which you the song. But at the same time, remember, you have Torah, first five books, and you have any instruction from any rabbi or any person is also Torah, but that's the little t. That's, that's yeah, but if he's referring to, you get, remember, in their understanding, if I give you, if, if I send Mike and I say coffee, milk and sugar, and we wrote that down in Hebrew, I gave him Torah, I gave him an instruction. So we need to, we need to understand context when it comes to those things, okay? So any sort of instruction, little t, God's instruction, big t. That's how they would have defined it. Okay, and that's what gets us kind of in trouble when you talk about Mishnaic and Talmudic. It's all Torah to them. To us, very different. So when a, when a rabbinic Jew stands up and he says, but Torah says, and he quotes Rabbi Mamodis, you're like, what? That's not in Torah. This is, of course it's in Torah. It's in Talmud. Check that. And he'll quote chapter, verse, and book, and all the rest of it. For them, there's no distinction. Okay, so we need to understand that logic has been carried through. All right? 
So Ignatius and Irenaeus, they said they, Peter and Paul founded the community in Rome. When you think of the church or, yeah, you see, I follow the same logic, which is wrong completely, is that as soon as we think of Rome, we think of a church, right? You start to think of Vatican scenarios. But when you talk about the community in Rome, I want you to think of this, probably small. Right, a small community in some dude's house, and they've cut it, they've made a, they made a hole in the wall where they put the Torah. And they hang a little ephod over it, and they say, that's the Torah ark. Guys, come, let's get together as family, and we'll discuss this. It's on the outskirts of town. They can never be in the community because... As soon as you get closer, their gods become prevalent and to walk the streets of Rome, to buy and sell in Rome, to go to the toilet in Rome, to go to bathhouses, to enter theater, never mind, everything is pagan, but you normally have to make an offering or a declaration to that god. You like being clean? You go to the bathhouse. Anybody here don't like having a nice warm bath? Go over there, but before you get there, you have to make an offering to the goddess Hygiene, where we get the term hygiene from. Right? Anybody want to go to a doctor? A hospital. Hygiene's father was a guy called Asclepius. They called a hospital in those days Asclepion. Today we have paramedics with symbols where the guy is where there's a big staff and a snake called around it. That's Asclepius' symbol. Right? Isn't that the Caduceus? It literally comes from Asclepius. But. You come into this place, and that's where they did the healing. So, who heals you? Asclepius. So, can I go to a doctor in that time? Absolutely not. I go hang on the outskirts of town. The reason why they called people dirt poor is because they were too poor to afford a floor. It was dirt. Self-explanatory. You cannot. You can sweep all you like. You are just moving earth around. That is the type of community I want you to think of when you think of Rome. Okay? Corinth, similar thing. Outskirts, away from, and yet making a massive impact. It's truly amazing. Clement talks about Peter teaching in Rome. Oregon and Eusebius uh, said um, Peter stayed in Rome until his death. And as tradition has it, by the church fathers again, they say he was crucified by Nero. And when, you know, crucified on a cross, he said, thank you, please turn it upside down. Because I don't think that I'm worthy to die the same way you should die. Now, what's interesting about that, that today? If I were to analyze the way people analyze today with Peter, and he used an upside down cross as a symbol unto death, what would I normally call him? Right, Antichrist. Don't be so quick to think that you understand all context of all things. It was further, further a thing from the truth. Before watching his wife being tortured to death, while kept on screaming, remember Christ, remember Christ, remember Christ, he went up and they said, you crucified my boy. He said, upside down, thanks. And that actually made it worse. Now, what we know about crucifixion is they did it to people they hated. Why? because it made you die nice and slow. Sometimes days, for the really strong ones, a week or so. You generally build up fluid from your toes up until the point of asphyxiation. That means the water pressure on your lungs so you cannot breathe. Right? It says in uh, Josephus that, I believe it was Josephus who recorded, it says they, re they reserved the right to use nails for those they hated. You think of Yeshua just didn't get a normal crucifixion. He got the extra special one. And even then they marveled at how fast he died. How would they kill you faster? Break the legs. Break the legs. Why, would that, why would that do anything? Right, because the only way to get the water pressure up is if I lift myself up and try and hold myself up as long as possible and then... Strength. <laughs> Shh. 
short, shallow breaths because that's all you can allow for the expansion on your lungs until you don't have strength anymore. It took longer and it was worse. And Peter said, that way, please. Remember, Yeshua already promised him that they're going to carry you and take you to a place where you don't want to go. They dress you in a way you don't want to be dressed. It was already prophesied that he was going to die in that manner. Okay? So that would have been a fulfillment of what Yeshua promised him at the time of the do you love me? Okay. Also severely traumatized. Lovely. Yeah. Come to church early, he said. Mm -hmm. All right. Quickly, let's get into All right. Let's quickly, let's get into 1 Peter, shall we? You just thinking? 1 Peter, we're going to look at his epistle. That's why we framed him as the man. So that you better understand the experiences he had to go through. That's why we framed him as the man. So that you better understand the experiences he had to go through, the lessons he learned. So that now when you look at him, we can appreciate the man. Now, there's a couple of different ways of understanding this. They believe that this was after Shaul, Paul was crucified. or Paul was now dead. No more Pauline epistles. Who's going to fill the void? And some people believe that they got Peter to start filling in the gap. Okay? So... It's an interesting thing. I've heard one commentary say that he makes a midrash. What's a midrash? Midrash is a study. A study on Isaiah 53 in this epistle. What's Isaiah 53 about? The suffering servant. Okay? And it's quite easy to see because the book can be broken up into two parts. Chapter 1, verse 1, to 3, verse 12. Oh, 1 verse 1, 2, 3, verse 12. It's really about being kadosh, holy, and dealing with struggles. And the second part, so again, suffering servant, something was holy, and being kadosh, and suffering. That's from 3 verse 13 to 5 verse 14. Okay? Our backdrop is that Midrash to Isaiah 53. So what we're doing is we're helping you understand Isaiah 53 through using the content of what you're dealing with here, W, to get you to that place. Okay? Now, you guys will understand the four levels to Scripture. What we basically have, <coughs> use a different pen, is an acronym, PARDIS. Okay? It's to each, and it's an interesting tool. You have the Peshat which means the plain sense, okay? That is as you read it, okay? The second section is the remes. What's a remes? Okay, a hint or a link to another scripture. We have the draj, which is the midrash, which means study. And we have the suit level, the hidden. Okay? The hidden sense. That hidden sense is a picture alluding to something. So if we want to say the life of Joseph, betrayed by his brother, sold for silver, 
lower it down into a pit and then lift it up to the right hand of the power. If I said that in church, everybody would say I'd be talking about Yeshua, but I'm actually talking about Joseph. Okay? Right. So when we start looking at a Midrash, he's going to take this and he's going to unpack Messiah through what they are going through. Okay? So understand that if you go, well, I'm really suffering right now, Vince, and he's going to say, let me tell you about suffering. Let's talk about Isaiah 53. But you don't understand. It's completely different, is it? Are you not his son? Are you not his disciple? Isn't that the point of what he went through, you will go through? Baptized, testing, testing, teaching, teaching, persecution. How many of you have gone through that cycle? Right? You open up your mouth about Messiah and all of a sudden it gets rammed back very quickly at you. So what we're going to do is we're going to start to slowly unpack this, go through little hints and stuff. And then what I want you to do if you're writing down notes, with every epistle, I just want to make this a habit, start looking for the problems. Okay? You have half the story. We're going to try and unpack it. I want you to mark down. So I'm going to make a statement. You're going to tell me what the problem is. This is the answer. Is that person still? There's no answer. Oh, okay. okay, cool. All right. So we have an answer or we have the statement, but the statement is addressing a problem. We need to figure out what the problem is to so best frame the epistle. Are you with me? All right. So if I look at Richard and I say, um, red's not your color, what would his question to me be? Not why not, that's the response. Maybe it's, I really want to wear a red shirt today, Vince. And to understand our, cons, uh, our, our conversation, or it could be, I got into an accident and I had blood all over my clothes. Red's not your color. Changes the context very quickly, doesn't it? Right. So, let's get into the frame. From Kifa, an emissary of Yeshua the Messiah. What's an emissary? Okay, give me the Hebraic term. Saint one, a shlichim. Okay, so we immediately pick up again. We see this in the apostles that we go from, let's call it in their context, a fisherman or a tax collector, someone in a normal job. In surgical profession here. To translate as a disciple. What's the essence of becoming a Talmud? To imitate your rabbi. It is enough. A student is not above his teacher, but it is enough that he becomes like his teacher. Okay? That's always in the back of your mind. You study the Gospels to practice what your rabbi practiced. You study Torah to better understand what your rabbi taught. That understanding should make halakha, how you act, what you say, what you do, how you love. It changes everything. It renews your mind because it changes the way you think because it's not what you saw, it's the way he saw it. Okay? So that's normally a seven-year stint. And from here, he says, go and make your own disciples. Okay? I'm going to put here Rabbi Slash Shlichim. Shlichim is an emissary. It literally means someone who represents, but even more so, someone who is sent out. If you wanted to know the king, I sent someone. That's what the word emissary means. You want to know how he thinks and what he believes I've sent someone. One day, God willing, amen, amen, 
you are going to be the shlichim that's going to go and represent Yeshua and Father to people who don't know him. And they will study you to better understand their God. So what you say is okay. What you do is okay. How you act is okay. What you interpret is okay. How you pray. How you are baptized, etc., etc. All right? To who am I writing? To God's chosen people living as aliens in the diaspora. All right. Action-packed verse. God's chosen people. Now, off the bat, we can immediately include Jews in that statement, if not exclusify Jews in that statement, yes? God's chosen people. Right. But this is where things get a little interesting. When you are chosen, and he carries on about this a lot, says, you have been chosen, my God. What's the problem? If I have to tell you, don't worry, you've been chosen by God. Don't worry, you've been chosen by God. What do you think I'm addressing? Eh? Faith issues. Does God really love me? Did he choose me? If I was a Jew, do you think I would have that issue? No. We've got Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov. The covenants are established. I have it written in black and white. We are his chosen people. To the point where they actually became arrogant about it. Because I'm a Jew, I've... Sorry? Because I'm Jew, I've been saved. I don't need to do anything. I keep to lie. I don't need your Yeshua. John the Baptist? Do not say for yourselves you are sons of Abraham. Because I tell you, out of these very stones, you can make up sons of Abraham. And it comes up time and time again in scripture where he says, if you are truly sons of Abraham, act like him. Do you have faith like Abraham? Do you have a relationship like Abraham? Or are you just running around patting yourself on the back because you were born Jewish? What did you do to deserve that? Right, because they knew nothing of their father. Okay? To say you're the son of a most high means... You need to act like the son of the most high. Okay? Otherwise you're being hypocritical and it's a problem. All right. So he says to the chosen people living as aliens in the diaspora. What's a diaspora? It's the dispersion. When did the dispersion happen? Right. Who came down? Assyria came down. Took out what we call with... Um, Grip that is in the, ten, in the ten tribes because of Jeroboam, and they were taken, they were captive, and they were scattered throughout. Assyria was very good at people planting and also selling off people wherever they wanted. Okay? Slave traders were the difference. All right? So because they were all over the place, they are living as aliens away from Jerusalem and away from God's people. Now, if you're a Gentile, even more so. Okay? So just for now... As we frame this letter, it will become more apparent who he's talking to, Jew, Gentile, or both in your notes. Question mark, and you will answer that question before we finish. Not today, but before we finish the lesson. They're living in Pontius, in Galatia, in Cappadocia, in the province of Asia, and Bith Bithynia. Let's stop there. Just a useful tool. Before you quote Galatians, understand what a Galatia is. What is a Galatia and can you eat it? <laughs> uh -huh. All right. Most people, most people, when we get to the point of, but it says in Galatians, it says in Galatians, my first question to them, tell me where Galatians is and then we can talk about context. Is, well, let me, let me, let me, let me just, right, let me frame it a little bit for you. Is Galatia a town? No, it's a region. You have north and south. It is made of towns. Which towns is he talking to? Problems that he's addressing in that area because there's three specific town names that keep on coming up where the problems are. And then you will start to understand why Shaul is saying what he's saying. Okay? So... Homework for you. Find out what a Galatia is and can you eat it. Right. 
chosen according to the for, according to the foreknowledge of God the father and set apart by the spirit for what sorry what does that verse say for obedience well that's a silly word obeying Yeshua the Messiah and for the sprinkling of, of his blood all right so you were chosen by God before you even knew that he existed listen up people he chose you he died for you you didn't even know he was real but the work had already been done. How spoiled are you right now? But the work had already been done. How spoiled are you right now? Okay. It says, you have been chosen. Now, if you take this understanding and realize that he spent a lot of time in Rome, how many of you were here when we did the study of Ephesus or Ephesians? You stick up your hand. It's an Ephesian. All right. So basically what we have is something called... How do you civilize somebody? Servitas. Okay? That's where we get the term. He is really... A... So let's check this, okay? Have we maybe adopted some Rome-like things in our walk? Right. Okay? Do any of you have a problem going to a gym? Right? A gym is called a gymnast. What's a gymnast? Uh, it's Right, okay, gymnast literally means nude, fantastic. If you've been into a virgin active bathroom, you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, you laugh because it'll traumatize you as well, right? I've never counted so many ceiling boards in my life. One, two, three. It's <laughs> the so only way I got through it, all right? I moved gyms, <laughs> all right? But basically what it was is a complex. Now, in this complex, when we go to Israel, amen, amen, we'll take you to places like Beit Shean. It's a Rome-like city. When you walk in, on the left-hand side, you have the bathhouse complex. And in this bathhouse complex, we find heated pools. That's completely foreign to our understanding, isn't it? And we have areas of grooming. We have places where you can get a massage. <gasps> Skanda. And we have places where you can chat and you can do business. We have advertising at the gym. Who would have thought that was possible? And we have places where it's a really good place to get 